in Zurich, Switzerland. And he's also one of the co-founders of SPUN, the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks. The mission of SPUN is to map fungal networks and advocate for their protection in collaboration with researchers and local communities across the world. Colin was also a graduate student in the College of Natural Sciences at UT Austin, so he's secretly a little Texan. Excited to have him back. Um, today, Colin will be talking a little bit about the latest research in fungal biodiversity, forest carbon capture, and climate change, among other topics. So we're so excited to have Colin um, talk to us a little bit about SPUN and everything that he's up to. As always, we invite questions, so please use the chat as much as you would like. And we're gonna try to pause about midway through the talk to answer some questions. And then of course, we'll have some time at the end to wrap up and also answer questions that were not answered. Well, welcome everybody. So I'm gonna hand it over to Colin. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the introduction, Chris. It's awesome to see everyone tonight um, or this morning, depending on where you are. Um, and uh, I'm going to share my screen right now. And just to give you, yeah, yeah, I'm originally from Texas, not from Texas. I've spent the last 10 years of my life before moving to Zurich in Austin. I'm actually originally from the Northeast. Um, but yeah, you know, Austin was where I really began my journey as an academic to study forests, fungal biodiversity, and how that intersects with the carbon cycle and climate change. And what's really exciting right now is that there's so much momentum around the idea of fungi as part of, you know, how we identify what an ecosystem is and also its power in addressing some of the most pressing environmental challenges of our time. Uh, so my work and my team here at ETH Zurich focuses on the forest fungal microbiome. Um, and to begin, I just want to emphasize that, you know, most of what we know about forests in general is based on things we can measure above ground. So as a forest scientist, we might count the number of trees we find in this forest. We might identify which species they are. We might even try to remotely sense features of this forest canopy from space. And all of this makes absolute sense. You know, above ground is where photosynthesis happens. This is how carbon and energy enters most terrestrial ecosystems. However, we also know most terrestrial plants are limited in some really important way by soil resources like water and nutrients. So to access those, you know, trees can't just build more leaves, they need to build roots. And to do that, plants build a lot of roots. And so in many ecosystems, there can be as much or more plant biomass below ground and root structures as above ground and stems and leaves. These root networks are absolutely massive, and the root networks of different trees in the forest are usually intimately intertwined. And so it becomes very clear very quickly that there's this enormous potential for really important ecology to be occurring below ground. When you look closely at roots, as you all know here in this room, and I mean very closely, you you realize they're not really roots at all. You know, they're also fungi. And so most trees and most plants on earth are in symbiosis with what we call mycorrhizal fungi. So this picture is a fine root tip, one of the most distal or the outermost in a tree's root system. And this thin layer of orange and white material is an ectomycorrhizal fungus. And what's going on here, of course, is that the plant and the fungus are trading. The plant is exchanging photosynthate and carbon and sugars and energy it gets above ground. In exchange for nutrients, these fungi are exceptionally good at acquiring below ground and soils. And, and one reason they're so good at this is because they build these sort of vast hyphal networks in soil. So you can think of, and I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but you know, you can think of hyphae as roots, but for fungi instead of plants. And a, a handful of soil easily contains over a hundred kilometers of these sort of hyphal threads coursing through it. But, you know, thinking of hyphae is, is still missing the point. That's way too big. You know, these hyphae are far finer than this. They're, they're about as fine as the individual strands of a spider's web or the individual fibers of cotton in a cotton plant. And because they're so fine, they massively enhance plant access to these really critically limiting soil resources. And so it's not super surprising that, you know, many trees invest big time in these fungal partners. So this image on the right is actually two pine seedlings, two loblolly pine seedlings, which is really common in the southeastern U.S., lost pines uh, in Bastrop, 
all la bali pine. So these are two little baby lost pines. Um, and at this point, their hyphal networks have become so large, uh, you no longer need a microscope. You can just see what's going on here. So in this particular image, in this particular early life stage, there's nearly as much photosynthate being allocated to fungal partners as there is being allocated to plant partners. That's how important, even at the very beginning of a plant's life, these fungi can be. But again, you know, this is still two seedlings, but now I want you to think of an entire forest with trees that could be, you know, up to a hundred feet high and hundreds of years old. You know, that's a lot of fungi. <laughs> and that's a lot of fungi because these organisms are absolutely essential to tree biology, how they exist in nature, how they evolve. There's actually evidence when plants first moved from water to land in the process of evolution, they evolved this fungal symbiosis before they even evolved roots. Um, but a lot of how we know this and a lot of how we built this foundation about why these fungi are just so important to true biology is from experiments that look like this. We sometimes call them in the field, you know, big plant, little plant experiments. So the tree on the right was grown with its fungi and the tree on the left was grown without its fungi. And I think you could have guessed that. And the tree on the right is obviously bigger and it's growing more vigorously. Uh, and if we do more experiments, we'll discover that it's, it's more likely to resist drought or it's more likely to resist attacks from you know, pathogens. Overall, it's just a better tree. But at the end of the day, you know, there's still only so much we can learn here. And that's because, you know, a tree is not a forest. And in a forest, we never really have this sort of case where we're comparing, you know, fungi with non-fungi. Actually, in the forest, there's always many fungi, fungi present. You know, there's usually dozens to hundreds of different species of fungi coexisting on the root system of a single tree. And especially once you consider the, the population of trees in a given answer or area. And so the question isn't really, you know, what happens when these fungi are present? The question is, what does this biodiversity mean? You know, what does it matter which combinations of fungi are present on the root system of a given tree? You know, whether it's a, a Rusula or a Cortinarius or a Geopora dominated community, does that matter for how an entire forest works? And that's a really hard question to answer. That's a question we can't answer with these greenhouse experiments. To answer that question, we really need to go and ask the forest. And that's a question that's really been, you know, we can finally start to ask um, using new methods from DNA sequencing that finally have become, you know, cheap enough to roll it at scale. And so that's one place where my research group has been focusing since 2019, since I moved to Zurich. And this is work uh, that's really been led by Dr. Mark Anthony, a postdoc who works with me here at Eteha. Um, and this is in a publication we recently had came out uh, in ISMA, the International Society for Microbial Ecology Journal. And what we did is we basically took the methods of the Human Microbiome Project, but we applied them to the forest. So if you're familiar with what the Human Microbiome Project does, uh, basically, it, they, they've really pioneered this idea that there's such things as healthy and sick human microbiome. So your gut, your stomach is filled with bacteria, and the bacteria living in your stomach, in your stomach, in your stomach can be wildly different. And if you have the wrong bacteria in your stomach, you can be super unhealthy and it's linked to all sorts of different problems, both in your gastrointestinal tract, but also, you know, increasingly it's being linked to sort of like your skin, your brain health, the levels of neurotransmitters and um, all sorts, anyways, all sorts of different health outcomes. And so the way they did that though, is they, they basically sequenced, they use DNA sequencing to understand which fungi live in people, different people's stomachs and whether or not they're sick. So what we've done is basically applied that tech to the forest. We partnered with forest monitoring sites. So places where foresters across Europe have been documenting forest health for decades. Um, you know, how big are these trees? Are they alive or dead? How quickly are they growing? And then we reached out to them and asked, can you send us essentially a handful of soil from each one of these forests. 
And so by doing that, we, once we get that soil, we extract DNA and we use DNA sequencing to basically build a profile of all the different fungi that live in every single one of these forests. And then by doing that, we start to ask, you know, are there fungi that are linked to signatures of a healthy versus a sick forest? And to begin, you know, our focus health metric is tree growth rates. And the reason we're really interested in tree growth rates is because how much a tree grows and it puts on wood is actually directly linked to its capacity to capture carbon and act as a buffer against climate change, you know, removing CO2 from the atmosphere, storing it in wood. Um, and so, you know, just to think about our process real quick again, um, again, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're sourcing the soil, we're sequencing the fungal DNA in hundreds of these forest monitoring plots. We actually do another step here. We actually, since I'm talking to my favorite kind of nerds, we're talking about fungi, we're going to go a little bit deeper. Um, we basically have genomes now, of lots of fungal species. So the Department of Energy has funded a thing called the Thousand Fungal Genomes Project, and now they're way past a thousand. Uh, and basically what they've done is provided a library of, you know, these fungi can do X, Y, and Z function. So they produce enzymes that degrade these proteins and this type of, you know, stuff in soil, but not those types of things. And so we take that library and we take our profile of who is there. And we turn that profile of who is there to a profile of what can these fungi do? And we do that with the genomes. And then finally, we basically build statistical models using different types of machine learning to relate who is there, which fungi are there, and what can they actually do to rates of tree growth. And this is what we've started to discover. So here I'm plotting tree growth rate uh, on a log scale on the y-axis. So basically if the number is bigger, the tree is growing faster. If the number is lower, the tree is growing slower. And here we're basically documenting something called a, a principal component axis. Really what this is, is a, a really complicated statistical way to condense all this crazy amount of information we have about all the different fungi in there into one number that really separates as much variation as possible um, so you can think about this as just like, are, how different are the fungi? So the, the fungal community on the right of this axis and the x-axis and the bottom axis is very different from the fungal community on the left of this. And what we quickly realize, if you just look at the pink and the green dots here, all the pink dots are trees that form associations with um, broadleaf tree species. So actually in this data set, that's all European beech and mixed oak. And 90% of the basal area in, or the, the, basically tree footprint area in Europe is four tree species, beech, oak, spruce, and pine. It's incredibly managed. Uh, and so we're focusing on these four. Um, and you see that those separate from the green points, which are the coniferous trees, Norway spruce, Scots pine, these are trees more similar to sort of lost pines and Bastro. And so one thing you learn that maybe isn't that really remarkable is that, you know, if you're a broadleaf tree, you have different fungi around than if you're a coniferous tree. But the really interesting thing is across these, uh, there's this huge relationship, huge, basically where if you have different fungi, you grow faster or slower. And this is after we've accounted for the influences of how warm and wet places or so climate and for different soil factors, for different soil nutrients, different soil parent materials, and basically all of this stuff we normally put into tree growth models at this scale. So basically we, we fit those models and then we add this fungal predictor and we find it explains this remarkable amount of variation in tree growth rates. Then we start exploring what's going on here. You know, why would these fungi, you know, maybe in this group, it's not that surprising. If you have different fungi in your roots, you can grow faster or slower. That is not a thing that's, you know, well accepted in the forest biology community, in the forestry community, in the carbon cycle science community. And so we start asking, okay, why? Does any of this make sense? And so we started looking at the genes and what's going on. And what we learned is that fungal community, forests with communities of fungi that on average across the whole community invest more in energy and nutrient metabolism genes. So these are genes involved in taking up nutrients from the soil, particularly inorganic nitrogen, grow faster, which makes a lot of sense. Yes, if you, if you support trees and their mission to take up nutrients, which are often extremely limiting, 
uh, they, they go faster and further. And particularly these downstream things like ammonium and nitrate, this is like the stuff that's in nitrogen fertilizers. And if actually we look at organic nitrogen cycling genes, which is probably not that important here, but, um, you know, they, they grow slower, which is consistent with some theory and, and, uh, we're going to skip this one. And the other thing we found, uh, that was really interesting is the number, basically number of gene models. And really what this is, is genome size. So basically different organisms, different fungi can have more or fewer genes in their genome. There's often a lot of selection among fungi to have bigger or smaller genomes. And we also know the ones with bigger genomes are the ones that build lots of hyphae and explore in the forest soil much, much more. And it turns out that the ones that do those things and have lots of genes and explore a lot uh, are linked with the trees growing slower. And so it's this idea that there may be a trade-off. The more the tree alligates to the fungus, um, the more they might be, you know, growing less above ground. And that, that's not necessarily a bad thing or a trade-off. It just means that they may be investing more below ground and there's lots of reasons that would happen. Um, but at the end of the day, the take-homes here that I think are really exciting is that, you know, these fungal predictors, adding these fungal micro, thinking about which fungi live in the soil, that ultimately explains threefold variation in tree growth and above ground carbon capture rate. So that's huge. And actually these fungal predictors predict tree growth at this continental scale better than the climate, better than the soil factors, which is remarkable because you just, you just can't explain this much variation in tree growth rates without the fungi. Um, and that's the other key thing here. And so the thing we're left with is, okay, cool. These fungi are really important for predicting tree growth. And this is sort of a big data correlational approach. What does that mean? And there's kind of two potential explanations here. One is that these fungi are just an amazingly sensitive bioindicator. They capture things about the variation in climate and soil nutrients that actually our direct measurements of climate and soil nutrients miss. They're just far more sensitive. That's one option. The other thing is that maybe different fungi cause variation in tree growth. Maybe it's because you have Rusula versus Cortinarius, you grow faster or slower. Um, to answer that question, we really need to do experiments. Uh, and so that's what we've started to think about, you know, because that's really what these correlations mean. And this is, again, draw, coming back to sort of the human microbiome analogy, when people discovered, okay, this is what a healthy and this is what a sick human microbiome looks like, they then just started developing treatments. They started asking, can we take the microbes from a healthy person? Can we put them into a sick person? And can we make that sick person healthy again? And, and that actually turned out to be true. There's actually treatments on the market today where you can actually, you know, buy do microbiome transplants from person to person to solve all sorts of diseases now. And so we started asking, can we do this in a forest? Can we turn a sick forest into a healthy forest? Can we introduce fungi that we've identified as potentially high performing through these DNA sequencing technologies and actually accelerate tree growth, accelerate carbon capture and carbon removal uh, and build a healthier and more fungally biodiverse forest. And so we've started doing this uh, in Wales, in the United Kingdom. Uh, so this is actually an 11 hectare or 27 acre field trial. My team runs in collaboration with a charity in the United Kingdom called the Carbon Community. And so this is actually a forester uh, in the UK, in Wales, planting a tree into our experiment. It's amazing. They do actually dress this way. Um, and uh, this is sort of a picture of the field site. And this is from a drone, just to give you a sense of, and this is actually just a corner of the field site, how big this trial is. And what's going on here is a block randomized trial. Um, so it's analogous to an, a randomized controlled drug trial that people use to test, for example, a COVID dr drug. But instead of being for people, this one is for forests and for land. Uh, and actually what goes on here, all these little scoops and these mounds you see this guy planting into, this is how they prep land for forestry in the United Kingdom. They, there's basically a machine that scoops up dirt, flips it over. That mound is actually where they plant the tree into. And what we've done here is we've either planted trees, business as usual, 
as it's currently done in the United Kingdom, or we plant trees and we basically do what we call soil transplant. So we take soil from a forest where we've identified using DNA sequencing that harbors potentially really important and high performing fungi. And this is really important in this environment. A lot of people are actually trying to convert what are basically grazing pastures across the UK um, that are not really creating returns for farmers anymore and were historically forests back into forests. And in these grazing pastures, we know the fungi that live in the soil look nothing like the fungi that actually live in the forest. And so that's why we think it might be really important to sort of rewild fungi in this case. So again, we're either planting trees, business as usual, we're planting trees and trying to rewild these fungi and ask, how does that affect how fast they grow? Um, and we've been studying this for about a year here. Um, and what we've learned is that we can accelerate tree growth if we're looking at Sika spruce, which is a forestry tree, up to 30% in this first year. So they're capturing 30% more carbon. And if we look at, you know, the other thing we have going on here is broadleaf restoration. So trying to bring back the, the native broadleaf woodlands that are historically what grew across the UK, we can actually accelerate the growth of those trees by 70% in the first year. And that's more wood above ground. That's more carbon capture above ground. And what's really exciting about that is both, you know, we can improve forestry outcomes in this land. But also, you know, we can make it go faster than it would have had we not introduced these fungi. And we're becoming to discover that that's really, really important as we think about the battle against climate change. If we can use fungi to accelerate wood production above ground, we can remove carbon from the atmosphere faster. And so what we've done now is take the results from this file, field trial, what we're discovering here in this pilot, and start trying to scale it up. And this is what we've done in the past year. We founded a company called Funga. And so the mission of Funga is actually to translate what we're learning from these sort of large scale fungal microbiome and forestry studies into climate action. You know, how do we actually start taking a completely, a much more sophisticated approach to forestry that actually thinks about the fungal microbiome, that thinks about which fungi are on the roots of trees. If you actually go into a forest nursery, you'll actually discover that most of the root tips on those trees are completely bare. They're completely missing fungi, which is not how they grow in the wild. And when we go and plant them, you know, we take so much care to make sure these seedlings are very healthy and that we're putting in the right place. Yet we have no thought about which fungi are on their roots, even though we've come to discover that they're essential to tree biology. And so one of the missions of Funga is to harness forest fungal networks to accelerate carbon capture and address the climate crisis. But also part of that, and the way we do that is actually going to a tree nursery and asking, why isn't this a fungus nursery? Why are we not thinking about which fungi are on the roots of these trees before they get to the forest? And how do we build you know, biodiverse and complex communities of fungi on the roots of these trees and sort of have a library of, you know, trees inoculated with different fungi for different environments. So maybe if we're going to sort of a, a sandy soil and a dry place, we might have, you know, a, the same pine seedling inoculated with a geopore community. But if we're going to a fine textured soil place with much more rain, maybe we need a Rucilla community or a Cortinaris community. The point being that you know, different fungi need to be fit to different places to create these outcomes. And so that's really the mission what we're doing here and really trying to you know, build as quickly as possible because we, we ultimately need to remove carbon as quickly as possible from the atmosphere. But to do this again, everything we're doing is really relying and taking advantage of incredibly biodiverse and complex communities of fungi. And yet, we really have a poor sense of where these fungi live across the landscape. What is the base rate of fungal biodiversity on the earth? We actually have come to discover that in certain places where people look very hard, where they've done repeated surveys of mushrooms in Europe in the past sort of 50 years, they've seen incredible declines in fungal biodiversity. Um, when they look at sort of mushroom surveys, essentially, and they think that's due to land conversion, from forest to agriculture. They also think it's due to intense nitrogen pollution. This is likely happening around the world, not in just Europe. We just don't document this stuff. We don't even know 
who is there, how much is there, and whether things are changing. We are completely missing that baseline. And for that reason, fungi have been completely off the conservation agenda and the restoration agenda. And so that's also why myself and my colleague Toby Kears have started SPUN, the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks. Uh, and SPUN's mission is really to map and protect fungal biodiversity on Earth with a big focus on the network forming mycorrhizal fungi that we study, but also considering all fungi. And again, we don't have that baseline yet. We start from the premise that just like the rest of life on Earth, fungal biodiversity is under threat. And the, what we really need to do is document global biodiversity of fungi and actually identify where things are high, where things are low and what is driving that and what, where things are really going extinct. And the way we do that is actually with lots of data. So actually we've partnered with a group called Global Fungi out of Prague and the Czech Republic. And what they've done is this incredible synthesis of data of where everyone's done, you sort of what fungi does, what my research program does, we sequence fungi, we get this molecular profile of all the fungal organisms that live in a given place. And they've taken all of that data that's in a million different publications and a million different repositories and put it in one place. And so this is actually about 20,000 observations from around the world where we have these molecular profiles of which fungi live in the soil. And so the first time we have sort of this really rich fungal biodiversity data from around the world. And so the next thing we do is we take that information and then my team basically brings in contextual environmental information. We go into each one of those point observations and we say, okay, how warm is it? How wet is it? What's the seasonality of that rainfall? How cloudy is it? What soil pH? How much iron is there? All this stuff. We bring all of this in and we build machine learning models to actually relate the soil characteristics, the climate characteristics, the human influence sort of drivers in each one of these locations to fungal biodiversity. And by doing that and using this much data, we built the first global maps of mycorrhizal fungal biodiversity at the global scale. That's actually really powered by really rich and high coverage molecular data on who's there. And so this is a map of ectomycorrhizal fungal biodiversity. So ectomycorrhizal fungi are the fungi that form the symbiosis with the roots of you know, lots of different trees, particularly our coniferous trees like pines and spruce and fir, but also birches and oaks, the dipterocarp rainforests of Southeast Asia are ectomycorrhizal. Um, and one of the most striking things we learned immediately from this map is that it's brightest in the highest latitude regions in the boreal forests of Canada and Russia. If you look at the biodiversity of plants and animals, what you will see is a latitudinal gradient where they're hyper diverse in the tropics. That's where the peak of tree biodiversity is in the Amazon and Southeast Asia or animal and insect biodiversity. But we see the completely opposite thing for these mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and you know, part of this makes sense. We actually think the active mycorrhizal fungi first evolved and diversified in the boreal latitudes. Um, and also the other thing you'll notice here is actually drier places can be a little hotter here. So actually, so places actually like Texas can be, um, you know, Western Mexico, um, you know, coming down the slopes of those mountains. Um, but yeah, it's just a completely different picture of biodiversity that we're not used to. And actually, if you think about the boreal forest, for example, these are places with like one, two, three, four tree species per hectare, you know, not, not, you know, very important ecosystems, but not places where like, oh, you know what's under threat? You know, that pine tree that's like massively distributed across huge areas of land. And yet these are places where there's massive fungal diversity. And so one of our missions is to actually, you know, start identifying places where there's unique communities of these fungi that are under threat um, and build the first sort of conservation easements that have ever been made, not based on plant and animal diversity, but actually below ground fungal biodiversity. The other thing we've been doing is start not just building maps of what we do know, but also maps of what we don't. So here we're, we're I'm plotting sort of and mapping sort of a, our understanding of what's, a, what's an exploration priority. So the brighter the color on the map, the less we know. We basically took all the point observations and asked, okay, 
you know, what's your climate, what's your soil factors, and then said, where on earth, you know, have we already captured that, you know, where, and then where have we not, you know, what places on earth have unique environmental characteristics that we've never sampled before, that's really important. And second, we ask, you know, what places on earth, you know, have we just, are just geographically far from where we've ever actually built a molecular observation of what fungi live in the ground. And we average those two maps and we, by doing so, we create this map of, okay, this is where we need to go next. These are the places where we know the least about fungal biodiversity, given this type of information, and these need to become priorities for fungal exploration. You know, as you know, if these fungi are so important to everything we do, and carbon capture and their solutions for forestry and their solutions for agriculture, we need to protect, understand, and explore that biodiversity and protect it. And you, you can't, you know, really manage what you don't measure. And so that's why we've actually launched as part of SPUN, which we just launched about six months ago, is, you know, what we call our underground explorers program. Really, what we want to do is facilitate below ground exploration by supporting sampling campaigns of researchers in these regions. So when we want to explore, you know, focal biodiversity, we can't do what's historically done. Like, you know, look at it from satellites, fly a plane. We can't charter a ship. We need a distributed network of people on the ground who actually can go, you know, look at fungi, measure soil. Um, and so what we do is we logistically support small grants, you know, only a couple thousand dollars, people who actually live in these regions um, to say, hey, I would like to go sample at this candidate set of locations. I think that's important for my life, my research, for whatever reason. And also that we ask, does that overlap with where we, you know, our darkest spots of fungal biodiversity, where we know the least. And so then we make that decision. And then we actually, once they collect those soils, we then say, okay, you know, thank you for sampling the soil. How can we help you get that soil to, you know, a partner DNA sequencing facility? Um, so we can actually get, generate those profiles. We can generate those data and we host it and we share it and we actually do all the bioinformatics and computing to turn, you know, that molecular profile into information that, you know, anyone who's interested in fungi can use. And so basically the other thing we ask of these spun explorers is to also be a check on the things we're doing. So we're building not only these large biodiversity maps, but maps of individual fungi. We've built map now almost 500 different individual mycorrhizal fungal species. Um, many of these are, are mushroom forming fungi as well. And we want to ask our explorers to be a check on our maps, essentially. You know, it's one thing for us to sit in Zurich and make maps of stuff. It's actually pretty simple given, given the compute we've developed. But um, it's another thing to actually know your organisms and be there. We need that feedback on the ground. Um, and so there's a lot of underexplored areas. We'll be launching this program in the next three to six months. Many of them actually, you know, Central Texas is a big dark spot for a lot of this. Um, and so we're hoping that we get um, interest in applications from people in the Central Texas region. And then, yeah. Ultimately, you know, we're coming to the end of the talk. And um, I just want to emphasize that right now is this really interesting moment for fungal ecology. There's finally interest, you know, that for whatever reason, people, include, especially people in this room, have created surging interest in what fungi do. Um, Films like Fantastic Fungi, uh, Merlin Sheldrake's book, Entangled Life, and so many other sort of pieces of work have like really penetrated our, our global consciousness about what are fungi, why are they important, what do they do? Um, and at the same time, that's intersecting with a huge movement around addressing climate change and a huge movement around addressing the biodiversity crisis. There's an opportunity to link these things in a way that actually brings fungi into those conversations in a really important way. We super need to do it. You know, have you really restored an ecosystem if you haven't restored not just which vegetation lives there, but also the incredible complexity and biodiversity of the fungal organisms that live below ground? And by doing so, by thinking about those fungi, can you actually, you know, also address the climate crisis? Can you? 
accelerate the restoration of these ecosystems. And so, so much, I think, really hinges on these organisms and it's just such the right time to be focusing on them. And so I wanna thank you all so much for paying attention and being here and doing what you do and pushing forward this idea and sort of the zeitgeist of uh, essentially, you know, both American and global consciousness, because without it, and without that activism, you know, these organisms are the ones that get missed. And so that's really important. And so with that, I wanna say thank you very much. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, it's super fun to talk to you guys. Uh, yeah. Right. That's great, Colin. <laughs> We've got a few. Want me to highlight some questions in the chat, Angel? Yeah, yeah. So there was um, um, going back to when we were talking about the studies in Europe, there were some questions about has there been any of this um, <clears throat> studies done in the US beyond what's now happening with SPUN um, and this database that you're working with. Um, and I think this is referred to like the, the field study that the, the trees that were be, being planted with the microbiome from forests versus traditional methods. Do you know yeah. studies like that happening? Yeah, so there's a couple that are really, really interesting. So uh, Dr. Stephanie Kivlin is actually at the University of Tennessee, but is actually from New Braunfels, um, spent a lot of time in Austin, at UT Austin, uh, has recently gotten the U.S. Forest Service to give her access to over 3,000 soil samples from forests they monitor across the entire United States. So we're very excited the next year or two we'll have sort of perhaps the most intense sampling of the fungal microbiome and forests of anywhere in the world in the United States. Um, at the same time, so that's it, but, and that's really is, you know, the sort of information that allows to diagnose, you know, this sort of idea of like, is there a healthy forest microbiome? Is there a sick microbiome? And what is it and what does it look like? Uh, at the same time, there is actually a lot of research out there that people have done and it's like squirreled away in like little tiny corners of the literature of sort of this idea of fungal microbiome restoration. Can we not just restore the organisms we see above ground, but also below ground? And so there've been a lot of small scale studies um, using a lot of different approaches to this. Um, and the results are really interesting. What people have learned is that you, you know, you can't just show up with sort of these fungal inoculants you could like buy off the shelf. So you can, if you want, you can buy mycorrhizal fungal inoculants tomorrow. Uh, and when people synthesize the information on, you know, the response of tree growth and plant growth to those in, in natural sittings, like the, the effect size is zero. They don't, they don't do anything. Often they're actually dead. Um, but if you actually start trying to work you know, with fungi that are actually from the, you know, your restoration target. So, so maybe near we're doing restoration because, you know, we want to rebuild an ecosystem that used to be here. And we actually have an example over there and it looks like that. And it's that forest. If we go to that forest and we take those fungi and take those microorganisms and reintroduce them where we're trying to rebuild them on maybe, you know, an abandoned agricultural landscape, that's where you see huge effects. If you actually work with the organisms that are native and complex and biodiverse to that place, there are real big outcomes. Um, right now, I think actually Liz Bowman is talking about doing some of this at, at, at Kenyonlands um, in the nature preserve. Uh, and then the other thing that's happening is um, fungus is trying to do this more and more in southeastern pine forestry, focusing on loblolly pine. That's the pine again, uh, bastrop and lost pines. That's actually a really common forestry tree. And in our focus there is just asking, can we use native and complex and biodiverse communities of fungi to create these outcomes? Making sure that you know, our managed forest landscapes you know, remain reservoirs of this fungal biodiversity and maybe even become better reservoirs of that fungal biodiversity while also creating outcomes for the above ground. So there's, there's more and more, uh, but I, I, and I wish I could point you to a big flagship project right now. I think we're trying to start some, but there's not sort of a big fungal restoration project I know of right now in the United States. Okay. Um, someone actually asked in the YouTube about if 
tree folks, like if they're using any of these methodologies in their programs, and I'm not, we've done a few things with them, but I'm not super familiar with, you know, the nurseries or who they're working with. Um, but I, you know, I thought I might ask, like, if anybody here knows, or if you know, Colin, if they do anything with mycorrhizae. Uh, I, I don't know uh, no. if tree folks says that we'd have to ask tree mm -hmm. folks. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And um, someone did uh, kind of bring up the question of like, can this be done in a nursery? And you addressed that a little bit uh, previously. Um, and kind of being involved in the organic gardening community, we always tell people like the same thing that you said, like these things off the shelf, you know, they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily going to provide the same mycorrhizal um, uh, uh, diversity that you might get, you know, if you have healthy soil. Um, and that kind of leads to a question that I have too. Like if you have a healthy um, soil system because, you know, spores are floating everywhere. Is, is it possible to like have mycorrhizal fungi sort of like eventually establish in, yeah. um, in your yeah. ecosystem? Like if you're inviting, you know, the biodiversity of plants, like does that slowly over time kind of establish on its own or is there any evidence? I mean, that's kind of hard <laughs> to, yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you need to be messing with this? Like, will the fungi find the trees uh, or the plants or whatever you're looking at? Like, do you even need to bother? That's a great question. And that's a question that people have been asking for a long time. And so there's like a couple of really interesting sort of high level pieces of evidence that can train that. One is that when people first started planting pines in the Southern hemisphere, where they are not native as plantations, they could not get them to grow until someone thought to actually bring a handful of soil from the original environment in the Northern hemisphere. And they actually used that to inoculate. And this is even back in the 1930s, they figured this out and earlier. And when they introduced that soil, what they were really introducing were fungal spores. And once they established the symbionts, they could actually establish those pine plantations. And so we know for a fact, like that you can have really strong dispersal limitation. Not all the fungi are always going to find the trees. Um, that said, right, like if you go clear cut, you know, a thousand acres of Lava Lake Pine or Doug in the Southeast or Douglas Fir in the Pacific Northwest, and then go replant trees, there's going to be mycorrhizal fungi there. They're going to grow, uh, but they're going to be really different. So people have looked using molecular profiling now in the same sort of DNA sequencing before and after clear cuts, especially of older forests. And what they learn is that 95% of fungal biodiversity goes extinct when you do a clear cut. So there are some fungi that are really good at hanging on, um, but they're just really different than the ones that were there before. And so you create this huge filter on that, you know, there's still fungi there, there's still mycorrhizal fungi, they're just of a very different type. There's ways to address that. So um, Suzanne Smart, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, has done some really cool research, thinking about how do you lifeboat those fungi? How can you uh, change forestry to increase the biodiversity of the organisms that are there? And so she focuses on the concept of um, mother trees. And basically what, what she means is leave some of the big trees in the forest uh, and, that, and those will remain sort of supporting a lot of the biodiversity that was there before you clear cut it. And so actually when you plant trees into those forests, often a lot of times uh, they'll see that, you know, tree growth and recovery and survival can be much higher if you leave those retention trees. Um, and then finally, yeah, I mean, the, the real question is, is not are there mycorrhizal fungi, but which mycorrhizal fungi are there? And it's really challenging to introduce the right ones without knowing what you're introducing. Many of these fungi don't form mushrooms, or if they do, they only fruit underground. And that's, you know, what we're becoming able to do with the DNA sequencing. So if we're trying to treat people with different diseases in the human microbiome project, like we need to like sequence before we do sort of 
the microbiome transplant from one stomach to another. And we're starting to get there with the fungi, um, but it really relies on the molecular information. That said, if you're doing restoration, I mean, I think there's more and more evidence that, you know, bringing soil from the intact environment to the massively degraded environment is a great way to reintroduce that fungal biodiversity. Great. Um, so Willow asks, and Willow, would you, do you want to unmute and ask your question? You're welcome to do that too, or I can read it. Oh, uh, thank you. So I just wanted to ask if any of the, um, like, mycorrhizal data sets that you were referring to are available to the public um, uh, for someone to use in a GIS analysis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's there's lots of data out there. I, I would encourage you to look at global fungi. Um, the, the challenging thing, unfortunately, is they're kind of opaque if you're not, if you don't, if you're not a bioinformatics expert. Um, Spun is trying to change that, but we're early. Um, we're still like, we're, we're just hiring our first scientific staff. Really what we need is sort of those profiles of who is there to um, be more accessible. Like, so you don't have to like put DNA sequences into a bioinformatic pipeline. Um, but that's changing soon, I hope. Uh, if you reach out to people who are uh, at Spun or different researchers who are trying to bring sort of this molecular information to these macro global scales, they might be able to help you plug in to some of those GIS pipelines. At the Craft Lab, we do this all the time. Thank you. Okay. Um, Kelly asks, um, are regional bio blitzes a good source of data? Regional what? Bio blitzes. Like sort of like where people add data, maybe be an iNaturalist um, or make take take collections. That's yeah. Sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. These, these things are awesome. Um, Stephanie Kiblin, again, a collaborator of mine, has has actually pulled that data. And so when we mapped the 500 most common mycorrhizal fungi in the world, um, we used a lot of point source data, both from DNA sequences, but also from someone has a report of, I saw a mushroom here um, and, we, and we used that. Um, so yeah, those can be really, really interesting. Absolutely. Okay, and Eric, um, he asked uh, for the Wales project, how were the trees inoculated at planting or in nursery? Uh, we did it at planting. Um, but ultimately, as we think about how we scale this up, I mean, the answer is the tree nursery, right? Like we have this choke point where you have, you know, millions of seedlings in one spot. And I think that's really the pathway to do this right. But again, critical to Wales was before we, we didn't just add any soil. We like went out and profiled and we're like, all right, these are likely the fungal communities that will create that outcome. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think the nursery is the way to ultimately scale this up. Okay. Uh, so Gabe asks, uh, have you found any trade-offs between forest growth rate and long-term above ground carbon storage? So generally no, which is awesome um, because it means we can actually do this. Um, but yeah, the, the larger, the faster they're growing, the more biomass, the, there are, in ge general forest ecology, it's actually pretty well known, the faster a tree grows, the more likely it is to die. Um, but those trade-offs start emerging, sort of once trees and forests are like more like 60, 80, 100 plus years old. In forestry environments where people are essentially tree farming, uh, the, the trees are harvested um, at like 25, 30 years. And so those trade-offs actually, it's before those trade-offs really massively set up, set in. So you can still take advantage of, you know, the ways in which these fungi accelerate tree growth because otherwise in nature, right? Like it, you can, you can live faster, but if you die sooner, it's, I mean, what's, what, what's it really mean for carbon capture? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chris, do you want to take some questions and I'm going to kind of go back through YouTube and peruse the questions there, make sure we catch those. Um, a few Eddie. more questions about tree growth, carbon storage, and um, kind of those relationships, um, Colin. 
But I'm also curious too, if you might speak a little bit to kind of the policy side and advocacy, like, do you imagine um, once you maybe have sort of a complete, I don't know, understanding of at least maybe a, one particular region, you could use that or leverage that to advocate for more sustainable restoration practice, for, for instance, or more conservation that is sort of including the fungal networks in, in those kind of methods or approaches? What do you that's see as the kind of policy angle here? Yeah, that, that's, that's a great question. And that's, that's a big goal. Right, like we have Endangered Species Act, we have programs for this, but you know what, what's on our red list? You know, it's it's plants and animals. It's very few fungi, and it's because we don't have the information to even say what is an endangered fungus and what it's not, and where do they live, and where do they need to be protected. Um, so Juliana Furci of Fungi Foundation has done a lot of incredible work here. Um, she's from Chile. She's got the Chilean government to actually acknowledge uh, fungi like as the domain of life um, in the Chilean constitution and as part of their mission to protect biodiversity. So Chile is doing it and they're really leading here. Um, we want this everywhere. We just need to be able to give, you know, it's, it's hard to regulate or create policy around something that you don't have any way to measure. And so that's where Spun is trying to support and build the data sets you would need to do that. Got a few more questions here in the chat, maybe that'll highlight. Um, Nico is asking, do we know anything about how and if using fungal inoculants in reforestation projects, for instance, has any effect on overall biodiversity or are there major effects on the speed of growth of particular trees or species? That's an awesome question. And I don't have the answer for you yet, but I can tell you that we have projects in the Yucatan and Mexico, projects in Wales, we're setting up projects in Ecuador and Ireland and all everywhere we can get people to do this to answer that question. I mean, one thing we really wanna know is, you know, in most restoration tree planting type projects, you know, even the best ones in the tropics can plant, you know, 20, 30, 40 species yet, you know, in somewhere like the Amazon rainforest, we're talking about four or 500 tree species per hectare. You know, we it's still, not enough. And so one question I want to know is when we rewild the fungi, can we enhance the biodiversity of all the things we didn't put there at planting, the recruitment of other tree species into those environments? I mean, that's a big question we have that we're actively measuring, but we don't know yet. Um, and we've got some pretty large scale experiments, like, yeah, dozens of acres to try and answer this. It's just, it's, we've started them in the past year or two. And so, and it's going to take time to meaningfully answer that question. But we can say that in many of these places, the trees do grow faster. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be more and more important, the more degraded the environment, so the more thrashed that soil was, which is a lot of these places. Most restoration in the world happens in ex agricultural landscapes. That's where you see a huge lift from reintroducing these fungi. Mm -hmm. You showed in the um, some of the slides the field test was being maybe undertaken on former agricultural land. Is that something that is consistent throughout the tests you're doing, or is it different kinds of landscapes that you're sort of evaluating? Yeah, most. So we, we try and partner with restoration projects to get this sort of work done where people are already making a massive change on the landscape. And most of where that is happening, yeah, is is ex-agricultural land. So in Wales, it's it, they've been sheep farming there. We know at that particular site for decades, and it's actually probably centuries. Um, okay. We just only have so much land use history information. Uh, but yeah, that's really common, actually. Cool. We've got a question from Kristen asking about the sort of impact of invasive species or thinking about non-natives. Um, has that kind of come up in your research? Is that going to maybe potentially affect how you map or think about the fungal networks? Yeah, um, I guess there's two sides of that. One is thinking about, you know, what is an invasive plant? Um, a lot of invasive plants are actually fungal killers, like garlic mustard is actually a great example. It's not one of very few non-mycorrhizal species. There's no fungi on its roots, and it produces all these chemicals that inhibit the mycorrhizal networks of the places it invades. But the other side of this is also thinking about invasive fungi. So as we move fungi around, one thing we wanna make sure we don't do is, is create fungal invasions. And so all the work we do at Funga, actually moving fungi around is focused on using native and biodiverse like communities of fungi that are actually from that ecosystem type. 
Um, but there are documented examples of fungal invasions, um, like Amanita muscaria, which is the Mario mushroom. It's the red one with the white spots that's in every cartoon. Um, that, that is not native to the North America. Uh, that's from Siberia. You can actually, uh, and Anne Pringle, who's a wonderful fungal biologist, um, documented through historical records that the invasion front from Eastern North America to, till it got to California. Uh, from historical records, because it's just so conspicuous, people write down when they see it. So that's one example of an invasive fungus, and we have no idea how many there are, because again, no one measures this stuff. Um, the other place we know is actually in South America, in, in Australia and New Zealand, pine plantations. Um, those are not native there, and pines are very invasive in a lot of those environments. Um, so they're invading into the natural landscapes in, in Patagonia and everywhere else. Uh, what's been really interesting is, um, you know, people from Martin Nunez's group uh, in South America and Dan Simberloff's group discovered that there are certain places where they were seeing pine invasions that were being linked to populations of feral hogs, just like pigs that, um, and they're like, why, why is this happening? And what they actually discovered was that the pigs would be moving around soil and by doing so moving around mycorrhizal fungi. And the more that happened, the more likely invasive pines were able to establish. Um, the, it's like wild uh, hogs, beneficial. Yeah. <laughs> Don't say that too loud. Um, so yeah, it's, it's super interesting. So, so, I mean, these fungi are essential to tree biology. So of course they're part of tree invasion. Um, one really nice thing, however, is that people have looked a lot, for example, where these pines are, are invasive in, for example, New Zealand. Um, and it doesn't seem like they're invading into the native forests. Uh, so eucalypt forests, which are also ectomycorrhizal, it's not like those are being taken over by these pine fungi. Um, but the, these fungi are essential to the process of a, a pine invasion in the southern hemisphere. Um, I'll um, jump over to YouTube and take a few questions from there. Um, so uh, Savannah asked, are there any studies mapped out uh, that show differences based on elevation? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's absolutely local scale studies that have looked up and down mountains um, and just like the vegetation massively changes, so does which fungi are living underground. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I'm guessing that's just kind of a layer of information you can filter and see, you know. Um, yeah, when we when we do the mapping globally, we find that yeah, topography is actually a big, big driver of you know which fungi are where. Okay. Um, so Garden Gates Open asked, how can I find information on microremediation for soils contaminated by ligustrum to save old oaks? And that's a little bit, yeah. I don't know if that's um a little too oh specific. <laughs> I wish I had an answer for you. Um, I don't, unfortunately. I, I think um, it'd be awesome if we did, but the, the, most of these things are, are, are not investigated and not known. It's not like, it's just no one's ever measured it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and then Ar Armando Sanchez asks, um, is there collaboration with indigenous communities um, in this mapping work? Yeah, so we're in the process of that Explorer program, trying to build out who we work with. And one of the things we're hyper-focused on is making sure we're working from scientists, with scientists or, or, or people who are just fungal experts, whether they're you know, scientists or not, who are actually from those places. You know, the last thing we wanna do is like helicopter in or send out you know, some you know, you know, European team to, to these remote regions and say, ha, hi, we're here to measure all your fungi. Um, we much, we, we wanna make sure we're actually supporting the people in those places. And so we have not done specific outreach to indigenous groups and, and we really should do that. And it's just, we're in the earliest stages of building this program. Um, and that's something we're gonna wanna do. Yes. Okay. 
Okay, so that's the end of the questions on YouTube for now. So we can jump back into the chat over here. Yeah. Well, how are you feeling, Colin? I feel like we don't want to keep you too long if you're super tired in this way, but just want to note that Lauren and Jack are pointing out this really cool resource, uh, the Fungal Diversity Survey. Lauren or, or Jack, do you want to just mention that really quick? Yeah, sure. So we are both volunteers with the Fungal Diversity Survey, and actually the director is here. Gabriella, would you like to say something? Nope, she gave, she gave, <laughs> gave a waggle. Uh, yeah, Fundus was formerly called the North American Mycoflora Project, and they've enabled a lot of community science to happen and to make good vouchered collections and spread that through the states as common practice. Um, they were shifting our emphasis as of late to um, conservation and documentation of under documented species. Um, species that are on the global red lists um, and that we know we need more data for because previously it was just um, people could start projects with any uh, group of fungi in mind or any region in mind um, but now we're uh, yeah working more towards um, with conservation goals more rare fungi and there's a northeast challenge that's being launched shortly um, and there's also the west coast challenge if you're in the states uh, for you to check out their species and um, beautiful pamphlets you can learn more about what to look out for and how to observe them with our team. And thank you so much, Colin, for your wonderful talk. Awesome, this is awesome. I just found your website. Um, and yeah, this is, I don't know if we are familiar with this, but I gotta reach out to Stephanie because we could totally use these sort of point observations in our, our mapping work. You know, we, we, we basically, we try and make sure we use as much information as possible and so, so we can use stuff like, hey, I've, we, we've found these mushrooms here. We've, we can bring in that, you know, bio blitz sort of style information. And so, yeah, this we is have, awesome. We have a, a project on iNaturalist that is scrutinized to be research quality um, that has over 50,000, is it? I don't remember, but there's, uh, we should talk. Gabriella, it looks like- our, I can send you an email, call, and I'm the director of the diversity survey. I don't want to take so much of this time, but we have over 77,000 vetted high quality observations and we'd love to to connect with you more and thank you so much for presenting tonight awesome thanks let's to jack them. and lauren too. Data too let's map them we'll do and it when all are, um, and when you all are ready to plug into the third coast reach out to us down here <laughs> <laughs> i have a question about um your modeling uh mm -hmm. so i've been just as a pipe dream. I'm a biologist who would love to get more into data science. And I've been uh, scrambling up and thinking on the idea of using weather data and well-vouchered records to start learning more about fungal phenology. And I'm curious if you guys have any interest or have people who have worked with weather data, because you had a huge list of factors you were looking at. Um, and are all those just uh, factors at the points you doc? documented at that given time or have you merged weather data over time with your observations? Yeah, so, so the climate data we use is sort of historical sort of climate data, things that really describe, you know, what is the climate of this place at, at, at the highest level. But, you know, this idea of phenology, you know, when are these fungi showing up and where and is the timing of fungal fruiting or anything else changing? I mean, that's massively unknown. And it's, it's really difficult for us to answer because we, we struggle to get sort of the spatial coverage we need, never mind the temporal coverage. Like, you know, how is this changing through time? Um, we really rely on sort of being like, okay, what's the, which fungi are in, you know, this intact landscape, which fungi are in this annihilated landscape and how is that changing? Um, but that, I mean, that sort of stuff is really cool. And like, that's the stuff we need to really start documenting the rate at which we're seeing, you know, these fungal declines or recoveries. Um, so that'd be really, really interesting. It's really just limited by the, the, the coverage of the data sets and the information. There's some cool stuff out there too from um, the National Ecological Observatory Network is a new thing in the United States, uh, sort of like the LTER, Long-Term Ecological Research Station Network. Um, but it's like, uh, you know, 70 sites around the US where they have you know, temporal monitoring of soil organisms, including fungi. 
there's a network called GeoBond. Bond is like the Biodiversity Observatory Network, um, and they soil bond rather. Um, and they're focusing on temporal monitoring, monitoring of soil organisms in as many locations as possible. Um, but yeah, I mean, really what we're limited by there and incorporating the kind of information you're talking about, like interannual variation or even seasonal variation of weather is really limited by the data availability. And like, yeah, that's it. What was the name of that national organization you said with many observatories in the States? Yeah, it's called NEON, which stands for um, the National Ecological Observatory Network. Thank you. And what was your colleague's name, Stephanie? Um, Stephanie Kivlin, K-I-V-L-I-N. She's at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Great, thank you. Thank you for giving us airtime to talk and ask questions and for this wonderful presentation. Yeah, and Thanks is your email somewhere? Huh? Is your email somewhere or a contact that would be good for you? Definitely, yeah, yeah. Um, you can email me if you Google uh, Colin Averill, you'll you'll find my webpage and 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 many emails. <laughs> Thank you so much. No problem. Making the fungal connections. This is yes. great. Myceliating in the chat. <laughs> the chat network. <laughs> well, Colin, how can we get? Can you just remind us how to get involved? Is the Explorer program launched now? Can we apply for that? And are there any things else we should be looking out for in the next few months or a year? The, the Explorer program is still early. We're hoping to launch it mid this year um, and we will be blasting uh, our social media. So one way to stay in touch is to, to follow Spun Underground on Instagram, on Twitter, on all of your social media channels. Right. Did I put the right at in the chat? Spun Underground, right? Or is it just Spun Underground? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, well um, we're so happy that you were able to join us. Um, it's such an early morning hour, and we'll um, uh, say goodbye for now. And I want to make one more announcement if people um, from the Austin area want to stay on. We have a work day coming up on Sunday. Uh, but thanks again, Colin. And we can't wait to get involved when you all make your big announcement. Awesome. Thank you so much for everyone for, for attending and for your attention and for your time. It means a lot. You know, we can't actually get these fungi, the attention, you know, they deserve without massive involvement from everyone, whether you're a scientist or not. And so it's awesome that you're here um, and keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, Colin. Thanks, everybody. All right. So okay. Yeah. So folks in the Austin area, we um, have our first work day to reboot the um, <clears throat> MICO research station. So a lot of y'all have come to know us from the MICO research station, which is a, um, a community space um, on Austin, city of Austin property um, that it's really, really like an open kind of space, like where people can do all types of things. So, um, Sunday morning, we're gonna be meeting out there and doing some light cleanup, um, getting things ready for our first workshop that we have out there. We're doing a watercolor workshop the first weekend of March with mycologist Dennis Benjamin. Um, the tickets sold out really quick because it's a very small class, um, but um, we hope to keep continue to use it for all types of uh, workshops. Um, I was out there today with students from uh, biology students from Houston Tillotson and um, you know it's a great place to do outdoor education it's part of um, uh, the ecology action they are the stewards of the land and so we partner with them um, and they allow us to use that space and continue to bring education around mycology and the ecology of the space and it's a former dump site so it's got a lot of interesting history um, and, uh, so yeah, so there's a sign up form on our website. If you can't make it this, um, Sunday, you can, can you can still sign up, uh, to get notifications for future work days and future events out there. Uh, so yeah, so I think that's it. Um, does anybody else have anything they'd like to share? If not, we'll, uh, 
say goodbye for the night. Thanks, Angel. This was great. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Thanks, Chris, for helping out. Yeah, of course. All right. Y'all have a good night. See you soon.